Man, today we get to, I get to introduce a very special friend, someone who is a dear friend to uh, Pastor Fawn and I. She is currently the president of Life Pacific University, my alma mater, and a school that I'm so proud of the way they have shaped not only their curriculum, but culture to raise up leaders for the world, the workplace, and the church. And Angie has been at the head of that for many years now, helped the school navigate a pandemic. That was the thing. Uh, that has that has crushed many small private schools. And under her leadership, our partnership with Foursquare is stronger than ever. And there's a vibrant culture of young men and women who are passionate about the things of God, not just to go serve churches, but also to go into the workforce and be ambassadors of Jesus and excel as managers or teachers or workers in whatever field they choose. And so you are gonna love her passion for people, her passion for our spiritual health, emotional health. Um, and so just get ready for that. I'm gonna ask you to give her a really warm living water welcome. And while she comes to the platform, a video that highlights some of our favorite things about Life Pacific is going to show. So would you help me? Welcome, President Angie Ritchie to the platform. Living Water. Good morning to all of you in this room and those who are joining live stream. I just want to honor uh, Pastor John and Fawn. You are amazing. Do you love your pastors or what? Amen. Aren't they incredible? And the culture you've built. And I just got to give a shout out to Alyssa. Alyssa, our recent grad. Here you are. You're amazing. Serving the Lord. And I'm so glad you're part of this incredible team. Well, before I get started today, it's first of all, it's such an honor. I feel like I know all of you. I know so many of you in this room and graduates who have come through um, our university that are now here. So, but this is my first time on your campus and it is spectacular. I might just move in. Um, uh, see you live Pacific. I'm coming on staff with Pastor John and Fawn. Um, but it, it's not just the building. It's not location. It's you and who you are, I felt so welcome here. But I thought I would, um, before we get started, share a little bit about my family, but today we're gonna talk about transformed in community, about transformations, what the university is all about, I almost fell, um, is all about, so transformed in community. So I wanna go ahead and show you just a few pictures, if you can put up a picture of my family. Um, this is my family. We've been married almost 30 years. Can you believe it? I think we may actually go on an anniversary trip this year. We're always so busy. But that. Um, I also have my, my son graduated, my daughter in love. She's from Spokane. She graduated. They both graduated from life. And my daughter, if you see that picture, if you go back one more, my daughter, um, there's something going on. She's in love. She's in love. She's 20. We've been praying. If you are a, a parent, you know how scary it is to think about who your, your child is going to marry because they're, you're stuck with that spouse, right, for the rest of your life. Not, not just they're stuck with that spouse, but you as parents are. So we prayed this person in. We're really excited. So that's my family. I love my family so much. But also, this is the university where I serve. We just launched the LPU Seminary this past week and we launched the Global Center of Pentecostal Studies and Practice, and we're so excited to really be a Christ-centered, spirit-filled university. And yes, let's just look at the community that I'm a part of. We're about transformation. You'll see some of our students. It's what we're about. We're not just about head knowledge. We're about transformation of the heart. Amen? We love it. We love it. I love my community. So as we talk about transformed in community, I'm going to share three key points with you today that I think will be game changers 
What you may not know is not only am I the president of the university, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. So you might get a little free therapy today. Anyone need it? Amen. I need some therapy. You online need some therapy. We all need it. But you know what I love is Jesus was on this from the beginning. So I want to start out, if we want to be transformed in community, we need to embrace community. That's not always easy. How many of you are isolators? How many of you withdraw when things are tough, right? What I have learned that if we want to truly change, there's no way around it. We need each other. Turn to your neighbor and say, we need each other. I know you may have tension in the car on the way, but you need each other. Amen? You do. We need each other. I want to read a verse today out of Ephesians 4. This is what he says. Listen, Ecclesiastics talks about this, that two are better than one, for they have more return for their work. When one falls down, the other can pick them up. We need each other. This is what Ephesians 4, 16 says. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. See, the goal of this body of Christ is that we grow together and grow in maturity. And I can't do it without you. And sorry to say you can't do it without me. And you know what? It's going to hurt sometimes. It really is. But the thing is this, healing happens together. What I've learned throughout my life is that we are wounded in community. We are. We're wounded in our families. And yet the good news of the gospel is we're healed in community. But places like this, as amazing as you all are, is often a place for we re-wounding. That's just straight up real. And what I love about Pastor John, he says, this is place is not just for us to feel good here, but it's to apply what is here out there, that, that we would be equipped in the world. See, Jesus modeled community. He had friends. When many were leaving him, Jesus asked the 12 if they were thinking about leaving him as well. I think his heart was hurting. Peter responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, John chapter six. And Peter assured Jesus that they would not stop cheering him on. That towards the end of his life, Jesus and his disciples said, Jesus said to his disciples, I now call you friends. Jesus had a loyal group of friends. I mean, he had his friends and then he had his three, like his ride or dies. Do you have your people? If you were wounded in community and attachment is hard, anyone attachment hard? Avoiding friends like, like come close, go away, anyone of you in this room? It is a challenge. But you know what? Relationships are the most powerful thing in the world. And the Bible doesn't just talk about this, but let me tell you about the longest, one of the longest research studies ever done out of Harvard. 1938. Listen to this. Harvard researchers embarked on an 85-year-long study to find out this. What makes us happy in life? Don't you want to know the key to happiness? You know, people spend lots of money to answer this question. Well, the researchers gathered records from 724 participants from all over the world, and rumor has, has it that JFK was actually one of the participants. So they gathered these people and they asked detailed questions about their lives at about two year intervals over 85 years. So contrary to what you may think, listen to this, it's not career achievement, it's not money, it's not good deeds, it's not exercise or vacations or status. The most consistent finding that we've learned through this 85 year study is positive relationships, positive relationships. So all of you now have to go sign up for the relationship conference in November because this is gonna change your life. This is it. Positive relationships, it's healthy community that keeps us healthier, happier, growing longer, helping us live longer in life. And this is what Hebrews says. He says, let us not consider, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not towards negativity, victimhood, shaming, depression. No, to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And the more as you see the day approaching, we need each other. 
we need each other. It's so amazing when I, I work with people that are struggling with depression or isolation or suicidal ideation. I ask them, do you have anyone you can talk to? Have, when's the last time you were with people? Does anyone know what you're going through? And almost 100% of the time, the answer is no. We need each other. So inspiring community is critical to your growth and mental health. One of the most renowned trauma therapists in the world, his name is Basil van der Kolk. He wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. He says this, being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives as long as we feel safely held in the hearts and minds of the people who love us, we will climb mountains and cross deserts and stay up all night to finish projects. Do you have safe people? This is the key. I'll tell you personally, I've worked really hard over the years to find healing in my life. See, we don't often know we actually are broken. We don't know we're normal, right? You think you're totally normal. That the way you live, the way you act, the way you behave, the way you eat, the way you engage is totally normal until you get into a relationship and someone says that is not normal. And you're like, wait a second, I'm normal, you're not normal. You're weird. And they're like, no, you're weird. My husband would tell me year after year, Angie, that's just not normal. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is like, this is the way it's done. Wow, until my life started giving me problems and how the messages were consistent. Wait, I gotta look within myself. My self-awareness had to grow. So we have to understand that we need to do our own healing and that happens in community that tells you you're weird. That's not okay. That's not right. That's normal. I love you so much. I wanna tell you the truth. See, inspiring community and loving community is the key to grow. So I wanna just ask you, who are your top three? Who are your people? And maybe you have people, but you are resistant to the truth that they are imparting to you that you're weird or this isn't probably healthy for you or this isn't a good look. Anyone tell you that's not a good look and then you lose your mind and with all your defense mechanisms, the very person that's trying to save you from yourself, you're annihilating, admit it, admit it. And say, you know what, I'm sorry. Turn to, your part, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm really sorry for not listening to you when you told me I'm weird. <laughs> and I need to change. I love this uh, multi-generational crowd right now. And I love you young people. Your parents really do love you and they wanna help you, save you from yourself. And, and parents, your kids wanna save you from yourself. My daughter is always telling me, mom, stop, back off. Be nicer, to the, be, be calmer, be, bless, not, be, be non anxious with a Starbucks person because they might spit in your drink, <laughs> right? She's like, mom, chill. <laughs> Community, it heals us. Will we be humble enough to listen? Ephesians 4 says this in the Message Bible, and again, I'm from a biblical university, so this is more of a commentary, all right? But this is the Message Bible says this, Jesus handed out gifts of apostles, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working with Christ's body in the church until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's son, fully mature adults. Am I looking at fully mature adults or am I looking at 12 year olds? You know it's true. You, are you 100%? Sometimes you're at your best and you're an adult and other times you're just like 12 or you're six. Have you ever said, you know, I feel like I'm talking to a child. You are. You're talking to an emotional child. But this is what Ephesians says. We're to grow as mature adults and together fully developed with, within and without fully alive in Christ. He says there's no prolonged infancies among us, please. Fully developed we will not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are easy prey for predators. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and tell it in love like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who is a source of everything we do. He keeps us step with each other. His breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow healthy in God, robust in love. And so 
when Pastor John and Fawn invite you to a women's conference, which I heard was amazing. Did you love Christina Inez? My girl, we went to Israel together. She's a powerhouse. Love her. But when, when they invite you to that and this relationship conference, you don't understand. They don't want babes in the woods. They don't want easy prey for the predators out there. They want you to be robust and strong. Your children need you to be strong in your marriage. They need you to be robust and strong in that pillar when they are going through things. See, we are all growing into mature adults. Well, that's the goal, but this is what I see. Look at this slide. Insecurity, confusion, disempowerment, depression, panic disorder, conflicted relationships, divorce, and the list goes on. You know what, these aren't the problem. See, this is what the generation thinks. They're like, I'm destined to be depressed. I'm destined to be suicidal. I mean, really, there's a whole victim culture. This is not the problem. This is the symptom of an immature, broken life. It's really, really basic. I love being a therapist. I love making it simple. You give me your phone, and I'll tell you your problems. I can help any young person within two sessions clean up their life. I just have to look at the artifacts of their life and do rule out, say, this is the problem. We follow Jesus. What does Jesus say about the things that you're doing? You're causing yourself your own trauma here by engaging in behaviors, dealing and continuing to holding, holding onto ex relationships, toxic relationships, unhealthy behaviors. And guess what happens? This. These are actually good things. These, are, these can be actually signs that there's something wrong and that we have to pay attention inward now. P A I N. Pay attention inward. Now, maybe our pain is a gift to show us it's time to change. Bazer van der Kolk also says this. He defines trauma, not the story of something that happened back then, but the current imprint of that pain, horror, and fear living inside each individual. Pain, symptoms that are alive and well in a life that should be mature, growing fully in life with God and others each and every day. Now, this isn't to shame us, but it's to say, we don't have to be stuck here. This is not our story. This is not your label. This is not who God says you are. I was talking to a 23-year-old intern who'd been working at a church for years and years, and I asked her one day, what, who are you? What, what are you about? What do you love? And she looked at me, and she had no answer. I said, so what are your passion? What are your gifts? Tell me who you are. Again, a blank stare. Nothing. No self-knowledge, no roadmap to her own process of human development and discovering. I thought, what on earth? Been in church her whole life. What has happened? Does anyone know this woman? Because she doesn't. And isn't it the role of the community to call out who she is and her greatness? See, we are transformed in community. But are we doing the work of transformation? Are we attaching? Are we bonding? Are we healing? Are we bringing our pain to the community and saying, help me deal with this symptom because something is wrong and I want to be mature in God? Jim Wilder writes this, and he's a neurotheologian. You may know who he is. I know Pastor John and Fawn love his work where leadership renovated all of his books, but he says this, maturity is developed in a spiritual family where mature elders and spiritual parents, I see you, provide structure and babies can grow. See, developing spiritual maturity means becoming who we truly are. It means your gifts, are you an evangelist? Are you outgoing and, and maybe annoying, but you can bring a crowd, you're gifted. Are you a prophet? Are you completely uh, polarizing? Do people think you're too critical? Do people think that, oh, you're a naysayer, you're negative? You know what? You're a prophet. It's time to bring your gifts to bear because we need to hear what you have to say. You tell the future. Are you an administrator? Are you someone who can organize? Your, your gifts are welcome here. Who are you? You're needed here. He says that we are to become who we truly are and the change of identity is accomplished through joy rather than correction of the heart. See, being transformed in community means that there is a place where we cultivate this joy, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute. But see, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, prepared beforehand that every single one of you should walk in them, whether you're 2, 5, 10, 
25, 65, 95. When Jesus looks at us, he always sees the generations. We need to work together. So how do we do that? Number one, we need to embrace community, right? Let's, let's embrace community as hard as it is. Safe community, by the way. Number two, write this down. We need to be aligned with God. What you focus on will grow. If you're focused on safe community and growing and learning, you're gonna grow. If you focus on your victimhood and how bad everything is, how everything sucks, guess what, that's gonna grow. This is what Romans 12, two says. Do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I don't know what's wrong with people today. I don't know what's wrong with Angie Ritchie today. I I have these really good days, and then I get into these weird mindsets that tell me who I am not and what I should be and what how things are gonna be, and I start predicting negative things in my life, and it's not even the word. They're cognitive distortions, they're negative things, they're things something bad will happen, and I think it's gonna happen to every part of my life, right? That's being pervasive in our thinking. These are unhelpful thoughts. And they're not aligned to the word of God. And so I have to be renewed, transformed. I need a brainwashing in the word of God. How many of you need a brainwashing right now? Amen. How many of you are stuck in some negative cycles? We just break those down in Jesus' name. We just need to understand the author of some of those words and scripts are not our Lord Jesus. And we need to get back on track and aligned with God. Amen? Amen. It's been said the greatest source of suffering, listen to this, the greatest source of suffering are the lies we tell ourselves. Wow. As French philosopher Michael de Montaigne noted, my life, he says, has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. 85%, at least the latest research studies, said 85% of the things that we stress about or we fear never do happen. And of the 15% that do, most said they got through it just fine or learned a valuable lesson. You guys, joy starts now. We are transformed in community. Joy starts now. We have to align with God. Joy starts now. We need to place our life before God. This is what Romans 12 says. Here's, this is what, Jesus, what Paul's saying to the church. Here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take every day, your ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around and place it before God, embracing what God wants you to do That's the best thing you can do for yourself and for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. It's time to renew our mind, align with God. Young people in this room, you wonder what's wrong with your friends. You wonder what's wrong with you. You wonder what's going on. Align with God. Do things in his way. I want you to really, I want to challenge you to be uncool. Be radically uncool. My kids didn't have social media until they went to college. I'm that parent, and it was really hard because I want them to be cool, but I'm gonna tell you, my son is 24, he's married, he's about ready to graduate from um, Berkeley College of Music with a master's in film scoring, and he's got a huge contract with a video game company right now. Why? Because when he was not doing social media, he was doing guitar. He was learning his skills. And when he got to college, his friends asked him, like, you don't have social. And they, they, they started to ask him, what is that like? And they started to say, Ethan, we're really like jealous. Like you're not addicted. And he, he, my son is totally free. Now he has Instagram. He does the things. But it's for his career. It's out of the right heart. My daughter just recently got it at 20 years old. I'm that parent. But you know what? They're cool. But I don't really care because they're whole. Because they're whole and they haven't had trauma and they haven't had cyberbullying and all of that thing. And that isn't to cast judgment. Listen, it was a risk. I hadn't been a parent before, but I followed my husband's lead and we felt like this was the route to go. And now I work with kids all the time in detoxing. And so we do a lot of social media fast at LPU. We do a lot of detoxing. We do a lot of blocking and cutting out people and following people and exes because those are all soul ties that contaminate the human heart. And Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. And I'm seeing life specific students finding rest in him and their identity and who he is. 
That's just one example. Let's place our lives before God and not getting comfortable with culture. And this is what he said. He will change us from the inside out. And because he wants to bring out the best in you. He wants to form maturity in you. Students, be radical. Save your soul, save your mind from the enemy's tactics to war against you. See, there's a better way. I want you to look at this verse coming up, Luke 10, 41. We need to think about being before we do. Before kids can handle social media, we need to, under, we need to make sure they have a, a core strength, a core identity be, to be able. I could barely handle social media, and I'm Gen X. I didn't get my first phone until I was 23. And yet we have little babies being formed by media. There's a better way. Jesus emphasized the priority of disciple making. Jesus and his disciples were on their way when they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Maybe she was distracted by social media and all the people that she had to impress. This is what Jesus said. He said, Martha, you are distracted by so many things. And Martha's like, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. And the Lord said, are you worried and upset? I see that you're worried about so many things, but few things are needed and indeed only one. And Mary, who was at his feet, said, she has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Counterculture, aligning with God, being uncool, Mary decided to be at the feet of Jesus. As Christian philosopher Kierkegaard says, the true vocation of every human being is the will to become oneself. It's counterculture to be sure, but limits are our friend. We have to be aligned with God, and with that comes limits, amen? How many of you are feeling convicted? Yeah, I know, me too. All right, abide with him. I wanna go on to this verse, John 15. Distractions can pull us in many directions. John 15 says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and him bears much fruit for without me, he can do nothing. What a picture of attachment. This is what's happened in culture. This is what's wrong with us. This is why we're not transforming. Guess what? Because we're not attached. We're not, we don't have attachment. If, I, if you want to know, if, I, if, if you want to tell me your relationship, just tell me your attachment. And everything makes sense. Are you attuned? Are you abiding in community? And are you abiding in God? See, the Gospels illustrate how Jesus ran away to lonely places to pray. When Jesus was feeding the 5,000, after that was over, he ran away to be alone with God. Being before we do matters. See, this is the key. You cannot give what you do not possess. And what you do, my friends, is important, but not more important than who you are. Who you are is even more important. And if this young generation can get that who they are matters, not what they wear, not what they do, not who they're connected with, this will change their lives. If you've reached a point today of self-sufficiency, I wanna encourage you, my grace is sufficient for you, he says in 2 Corinthians, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest in me. I want you to be encouraged today to build your life. And so I'm gonna end with the last point. I'm gonna give you some real practical application to be transformed in community because it sounds good, it, it sounds hard, but it's not as hard as we might think. Ephesians 4 verse 32 says this, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Live intentionally. See, joy starts here. It starts here at Living Water, but guess what? It starts here in you. <laughs> Ephesians, says, 1 Thessalonians talks about encouraging one another and building one another up. But most of the problem, ha problems happen. Do you know when problems happen? Do you know when addictions happen? Affairs happen. Social media addiction happens. Cutting happens. Do you know when that happens? It's going to blow your mind. When joy gets too low. 
When joy gets too low, these things happen. They say addiction is also a disconnection disorder. When we've lost connection with others and ourselves. See, substance abuse, again, social media affairs are reached for mainly when the brain is in a low joy state. See, we've seen people leave marriages, form addictions, fall from grace, and even take their lives. Why? Joy got too low. We are made for joy and joyful belonging. And what's so crazy, listen to this. Joy is mentioned 476 times in scripture, more than eternal life. Turn to your neighbor and say, joy is mentioned a lot in the Bible. (laughs) Joy is mentioned a lot. So this means that joy is really important. Joy is important. It's significant. Galatians 5 talks about that joy is a fruit of the spirit. If we're in God, we're supposed to radiate joy. And have you ever noticed how people aren't joyful? Like Christians, I look at them all the time. I, I watch people. Are you people watchers? I love to watch people. I'm like in Target. I'm just watching people argue and children disobeying and then moms being tense and husbands being disengaged. It's fun. It's so fun. But what I see is a lot of low joy. You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. The fact is that joy changes the brain. And the neurotheologian that talks about joy is Dr. Jim Wilder. I want to show you a picture of him. So I got to meet someone who changed my life. I read the book, Living from the Heart Jesus Gave You. If you want joy and you want to understand your traumas and all the things in a very simple way, so it's not overcomplicated. I don't like complicated. I want people to be healed as quickly as possible. I read that book. It changed my life. Jim became an indirect mentor to me, helping me form attachment, helped me understand love bonds versus fear bonds. He helped me understand traumas, things that happened to me and things that happened to me by their absence, like not getting certain things. That changes us. Well, I got to invite him to LPU, and I think John and Fawn were there. And the thing that I could tell you about Jim Wilder is this. When I met him, he looked at me so intently, and he was fully attuned to everything I had to say. In fact, not only that, his eyes lit up when he talked to me as if he was actually excited to see me, and if actually what I had to say was interesting. Wow. I mean, it so destabilized me how I felt in his presence. And he's a therapist. He's amazing. He he was just being himself. That one night after a session, I called my husband. I left early, and I was just crying. I was like, babe, I don't know. Jim just made me feel like he actually saw me. And I know that people like me, but, but it was just that ability to be attuned. See, joy shouldn't be a secret. It's just too important. Joy is what ignites the process of personal and spiritual transformation. If you are trying to grow or change in any way, joy is the key ingredient that makes change last. Human biology was made for joy. See, Jim understood that he works with communities, and he said, if there's no joy, there's no change. What's your house feel like? If I came over, what's the temperature? Seriously, what's the climate? You're the temperature setters. Where's my ladies? We're emotional. Y'all are emotional. You're a force field of nature. We love you, powerhouses. I mean, that force field that came from this church after probably the conference was probably out of control, right? Your spirits were high. You're ready to change the world. Listen, when you... Your kids, when they walk into the house and your backs turn to them, they know, they know the mood because you're a force field. They know when it's a good time to ask and when it's not a good time. We are temperature setters. Men, you're protectors. You create culture. You create protection over the home. What's your temperature? Can your wife and children thrive under your leadership or is there low joy? It's on you. I'm sorry, John. I'm just offending your, your people. I, I, I can't help myself. That challenger, it's on you. Moms and dads, do your kids want to talk to you? They don't. It's on you. It's on you. You want their attention? Where were you when they wanted your attention? Own it. Transformed in community. But joy is a central ingredient. Jim has written countless books Joy is a relational experience. You can't choose joy. Don't, don't get that quote. You don't choose joy. It's an experience. Joy is relational. That forms the basis for spiritual experience. It's the feeling when people fall in love. 
When their baby, their first love, a puppy or a face that just lights up to see us. This can be demonstrated by modern brain science, which reveals that our brains light up when we have these relational experiences. Unsurprisingly, this is in line with the teachings of scripture and those who teach spiritual transformation. When someone greets you with a scowl or like, oh, it's you again, low joy. Where's the, dick? Where's the drugs? Where's the porn? Where's all the stuff? Because we're craving attention. Scripture demonstrates that joy happens when we recognize and experience that God is with us. The gospel refers to Jesus as Emmanuel, which means God with us. And in John 16, Jesus describes his followers that they will be sorrowful but a little while, but they will feel joy when he returns. We are designed for joy. If we can have the keys come up, I would love to just have some, and we'll get the worship team prepared. But I want you to think about this. Nehemiah 8.10 says this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That is no joke. That is biological, it's spiritual, it's in every way the God-given truth. Raise your joy, raise your transformation. Raise your joy, raise your strength. Raise your joy, raise community. The scripture reads that Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and the teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, this is the holy, um, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do nor mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go enjoy, enjoy choice food and drink and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What was going on here is Israel was being confronted with their sin. Some of you are sitting here like, dang. I mean, Angie Ritchie has to say, am I bringing the joy? When my husband calls me, do I use the pleasantries? Do I say, hey, babe, how are you? Or do I bark at him and say, this is not a good time? Am I training my husband not to call me? Or do I say, you know what? You are the most important person in my life for 30 years. And everything stops when you call me. Does he get a smile when I walk in the door? And do I get one back? When my kids come to me with issues and problems, do I open up space and say, what do you need? I'm here for you. And I'm attuning to you. Maybe you aren't parents or maybe you're not married, but you have people in your life, siblings, coworkers. What's your posture? Are you gonna let transformation happen in community or are you going to propagate low joy? See, Israel was told, don't grieve for your conviction. Change your ways. The sin in your life can be changed. But now go have a party and raise the joy. Some of you need to go home today and have joy. Some of you need to, on the way home, say, babe, I'm sorry. And you're like, I'm sorry too. Or mom, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry too. Now let's go to lunch and have a great day. Amen. So I want to leave you with something today. I want to leave you with some practical neuroscience. These are ways that we can build joy. And joy is actually primarily transmitted through the face. So turn to your, someone you're sitting to, it could be a stranger, and say, joy is transmitted through the face. Say it. Yeah. Especially the eyes. And it's secondarily through the voice. So I'm going to give you some tips today, some neuroscience and spiritual truth because right now, you may not know this, but Jesus is looking at you in your face right now. He's looking down at you. You know what Jesus is doing? He's smiling. He is smiling at you. So the first living water, this is what we're going to do to be transformed in community. We're going to start with the basics. We're going to smile. We're going to smile. Whenever you greet those you love, and you're going to use sincere voice tones. You're gonna live intentionally and you're gonna and you're gonna probably mess up and you're gonna bark and you're gonna maybe not look at someone and you're gonna pass by and a drive by hello, but you're gonna catch yourself and you're gonna stop and you're gonna look squarely in the eyes and say, I am glad to see you. You're gonna ask questions and invite others to tell you truthfully how they're doing and what they're thinking about. You're gonna take a serious interest in really knowing the other person. And you're going to work hard to understand their fears, their joys, their passions, talents, and pain. And you don't have to solve problems. 
but just to listen. I see you, I hear you. You're gonna treat each other with dignity and respect. And when any discussion, try to make both people feel affirmed. You're gonna use touch whenever appropriate and legal. <laughs> you're gonna hold hands, you're gonna link arms, you're gonna give hugs and use physical connection as effectively as you can. And you may say, Angie, this has just gone too far. I'm not a hugger. I don't care. We have to build attachment. You're not a hugger because there's been an attachment breach in your life and you don't want to get close. It doesn't matter if you're a six foot, 65 year old man or a 12 year old girl, we need connection. So I want you to link arms. I'm, I know I'm going there. Now, you don't have to, I'm not mandating, but I want you to link arms literally with someone next to you. And I double dog dare you to do this in the grocery store. Just, I mean, just, just skip along the yellow brick road with your friend or your daughter or your cousin. But link arms, you have to understand that we're made and wired for connection and physical is part of this. Discover what brings the other person joy and give little surprises that will cause their eyes to light up and let your eyes light up too. Cherish babies and children by establishing that you are authentically glad to be with them. And this is how, my friends, and yes, I know you're still linking arms and you may feel awkward, but you know, I'm here to help you move the needle, okay, into attachment. And sometimes it's uncomfortable, but I'm leaving soon, so you can be mad at your pastors. <laughs> but we are building joy, amen. How many of you even feel something happening in your heart right now? There's something happening because you cannot, you cannot resist the way the Father works in the lives of his people, and it's through attachment. So Living Water, I want to ask you this question. Where will be you begin? See, joy is the soil of transformation. There's no other way around. If you want to change a life, you want to change your kids, some of you are so frustrated. Joy is the soil for transformation. There is no other way. So today, the Lord is asking you to do something different. Number one, my question for you is, will you embrace community? Number two, will you align with God and do it his way? And number three, will you live intentionally and raise joy in your life and throughout your homes and community? If you're with me, will you pray with me and open your heart to God? And then we're gonna enter into worship and we're gonna say, Lord, yes and amen.